In late August 2023, Huawei quietly, not so quietly, started selling its own phone chips again. Without much fanfare, the Huawei Mate 60 Pro went on sale in its online store, and what everyone's talking about is the phone's SoC, the Kirin 9000S, a 7 nanometer class chip. Huawei didn't say who made this SoC, but it is most likely our old friend, SMIC. The whole thing has turned into a real kerfuffle. In this video, we're going to talk about the Mate 60 Pro and its Kirin 9000S. A note before we start, this is a current event. More news will break, and that news may invalidate what I will have to say in this video. I talked to a few people for their thoughts, but the only information I have is what everyone else has. Again, like last time, I'm not interested in American failure doomers, China triumphalism, or any other general nastiness. I want to remind you, one day we are so back, the next day it's so over. I also want to politely remind you that 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, and other such labels have no bearing on the transistor's actual sizes. These are marketing names assigned to classes of chips. The transistors are not actually 7 nanometers apart. The name signals a class of performance. Okay, that's that. And finally, please be civil in the comments. If you're angry, take a deep breath and go do something else. Life is too short. Now that we have acknowledged all this, again, let us break this down together. The Mate 60 Pro is a very nice phone. According to Tech Insights, the Kirin 9000S is a 107 square millimeter die. This is about 2% larger than the Kirin 9000 and Kirin 9000e, which were the last leading edge chips Huawei shipped. That chip was briefly produced using TSMC's 5 nanometer process until American sanctions ended that association. This new 7 nanometer class chip is about 5 to 6 years behind the leading edge. TSMC has been shipping 3 nanometer class chips throughout this year in preparation for the September iPhone 15 launch. Teardowns and speed tests imply that the Kirin 9000S supports 5G connectivity. However, Huawei seems like they're trying to hide that. In a recent press release mentioning the phone, they did not bring up 5G support, and the phone OS itself reports 4G on the surface. I'm curious why Huawei seems to be hiding the 5G functionality. We know Apple has been trying to ninja their way around Qualcomm's modem patents for a very long time. If I were Qualcomm, I would be giving this phone to my best patent lawyers. The SoC CPU core is a customization on top of ARM IP. The GPU appears to be a new custom design done by Huawei or HiSilicon. The new design caused weird texture errors when playing popular games like Genshin Impact. Those, of course, will be fixed in time. Everyone is talking about the yields, and indeed that's the big thing we all want to know. Dylan Patel of Semi-Analysis wrote that SMIC's early yields with this node are likely to be far higher than we expect. Yields always start low, but ramp up as the fab improves. TSMC scaled N7's yields far enough to supply an iPhone launch. The same for SMIC. The more phones Huawei sells, the faster that will happen. All in all, we know very little about this chip. Very little has been released, and I suspect that that is more a feature than a bug. We will probably learn more later, but let me be clear. This 7 nanometer chip is real, and the node that made it looks to be really, really good. The first thing that I thought when I first heard about this was, why are we all so surprised? In the last video I did on this, I said that we should not be surprised to see a high silicon chip coming with this 7 nanometer SMIC N plus 2 process node. I should have been more clear in the video that high silicon is Huawei. So I was saying that we should expect a 7 nanometer chip for a Huawei phone soon. Furthermore, early last month, Nikkei Asia mentioned offhandedly that SMIC was working with Huawei on a new 5G chip. Now it is here. We first heard news of the SMIC N plus 2 process in July 2022. At the time, the process node was being used for a Bitcoin miner. This makes sense to me because Bitcoin miners have repetitive structures, so they are good use cases for improving the node. A phone SoC like the Kirin 9000S, on the other hand, is a far more complicated chip to produce. The fact that they have been able to do it and do it so well shows the tremendous progress that co-CEO Liang Mong Song and SMIC have been able to produce in just about a year. Second thing, we should not be surprised to see even more advanced chips coming. 
In January 2022, legendary TSMC R&D director Dr. Bern Lin, the father of 193nm immersion lithography and a colleague of Liang Bong Song, said in an interview that SMIC can fab even 5 nanometer class chips with only multi-patterning. Immersion lithography is the key technology here. It is maybe one to two decades old, but they are still perhaps the best lithography machines in the world. They matter more than we think. The United States banned EUV lithography exports, but that was perhaps a red herring. I have been thinking recently about slowing EUV lithography insertion. Perhaps EUV as we know it today lacks the throughput, power, and cost requirements to be competitive for full utilization. In such a case, 193nm immersion machines like the TwinScan NXT2000 and higher will still do 70-80% to 80% of the litho work for Intel, TSMC, and Samsung in their latest nodes, perhaps even for the foreseeable future. The administration stopped short of a 193i ban at the time, apparently because they felt that Japan and the Netherlands would not come along. It was not until June 30th, 2023, a year later, that the Netherlands and Japan finally joined together with the United States to impose these export restrictions. And ASML was definitely unhappy about it. They are trying to sell all the DUV immersion machines they can before the end of the year. What this means is that SMIC still has plenty of these machines to ramp up 7 nanometer production and make the move for 5. Keeping in mind that these machines do break down, need spare parts, maintenance, sanctions can expand, etc. Ergo, I fully expect a 5 nanometer class Huawei chip coming down the line, probably in 1 to 2 years. No doubt that they already have it specced out in some Huawei SMIC lab. And when that news breaks, I'll probably have to make this exact same video again. This Mate 60 phone is more than just a great high-performing chip. It is also ensconced within an ecosystem of domestic Chinese suppliers, and they have come together to create a phone that is feature parity with the market. Bloomberg mentioned the phone's many domestic suppliers. This includes the radio frequency front-end module and the satellite communications modem for the phone's satellite calls feature. With the exception of the memory, which seems to have come from SK Hynix. Oh, whoops, how did that happen? The whole phone is basically a China-only ecosystem. The pieces are set for a complete, self-contained ecosystem within the People's Republic of China to produce all sorts of domestic electronics, smartphone SOCs, CPUs, Edge AI, NPUs, GPUs, and AI accelerators. And therein lies the rub. At the end of it, a phone chip on par with something released five years ago is not a huge deal. W well, it's probably going to be a huge deal for Qualcomm, Apple, and MediaTek. Guomingqi posted that Qualcomm sells tens of millions of chips for Huawei phones. These sales are likely to be replaced by the new Kirin 9000S and others like it. And as Dylan notes, every non-Chinese semiconductor maker and Apple will lose business to this new domestic chip. SMIC will probably be busy fulfilling Huawei orders for the next year or so, but if I were them, I would be immediately looking to find new N plus 2 node customers in high-powered computing. A partner to make a domestic AI accelerator, a Chinese version of the NVIDIA A100 or Google TPU, so to say. So I fully expect to hear news of a Chinese 7 nanometer AI accelerator coming in one to two years, perhaps designed by Byron, Baidu, Alibaba Cloud, or Tencent, unless sanctions intervene. Now what should China do next? The Chinese are building up their native semiconductor and technology ecosystem, and it is real. Their work deserves praise, especially after being so hard hit by sanctions. The main goal from a semiconductor manufacturing perspective should be to widely distribute this phone to as many people as possible. Scale means everything. Millions of units are being sold right now, but we need millions more. They need to be selling this phone and its chips not only to Chinese domestic consumers, but also to Europeans, Australians, Southeast Asians, and Latin Americans. This might be challenging since Huawei phones don't ship with Google products, but Huawei has been doing a lot of influencer marketing, trying to get the word out to people on how to put Google products back on Huawei phones. Every export sale not only is a loss for Western phone makers, but also strengthens SMIC. The more chips sold, the more chips SMIC makes. The more chips they make, the faster they can raise yield and achieve profitability. And with that, they can more quickly fund their move to 5 nanometers. Also, 
SMIC should start reviewing and replicating the advanced packaging technology stack. In the packaging world, phone chips emphasize thinness and heat, so they use thinner things like chip scale packaging. But if we want to get to what is next, which is advanced AI, then there are other things to consider like data bandwidth. These require new packaging architectures like chiplets and 2.5D die stacking. Again, not impossible for them. The Chinese government will also need to shore up their domestic semiconductor manufacturing equipment ecosystem. That means replacing ASML, Applied Materials, Tokyo Electron, LAM Research, and all the metrology guys. Every piece of foreign equipment probably has a kill switch back home. I'm pretty sure that ASML does. So better start writing those checks. Now how should the United States respond? For more, I'm bringing in guest correspondent and U.S.-China tech relations expert Jordan Schneider of China Talk. I'm a longtime fan of his work, and I think you'd all enjoy his popular podcast and YouTube channel. And he says, In the rollout to the October 7th restrictions, the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security laid out the justification for cutting off foreign support for, quote, advanced semiconductors defined as logic ICs at 16-14 nanometer or below, or using non-planar transistor architecture. The restrictions implemented in this rule follow extensive U.S. government consideration of the impact of advanced computing ICs, supercomputers, and semiconductor manufacturing equipment on enabling military modernization, including the development of weapons of mass destruction and human rights abuses. Translation, the U.S. government has intelligence that makes clear that China getting the ability to manufacture advanced logic chips has significant implications for the regional military balance of power. Given the progress SMIC and Huawei have made, on the current trajectory, if the U.S. government believes that a Chinese 7 nanometer node remains an eventual threat to its national security, well then, they might try a little harder to stop it. This requires a better understanding of what semiconductor manufacturing equipment is still coming through. SMIC depends on foreign equipment for this node. Domestic suppliers remain years behind no matter the propaganda. Today, equipment companies like Applied, LAM Research, Tokyo Electron, and KLA are able to sell pretty much their entire suite of tools. Most tools for deposition, etch, metrology, epitaxy, and so on used for 7 nanometers and even 5 nanometers can also plausibly be used in 28 nanometers. These tools are being sold to the likes of SMIC ostensibly for use at lagging edge nodes, though they are almost certainly being repurposed to make chips like the Kirin 9000S. It's not too late to ensure that China isn't able to develop leading edge capacity at scale. The US government, in cooperation with allies in Japan, the Netherlands, and Germany, should consider tighter export controls that target the tools currently being repurposed, like argon fluoride immersion lithography, mask and CMP equipment, as well as far less liberal use of licenses to firms like SMIC on the entity list. Thanks, Jordan, for your thoughts. In my video about Korean semiconductors, I mentioned that in 1986, Samsung shocked the Japanese with their 1 megabit DRAM chip, closing the Korean-Japanese semiconductor gap from 5 years to just 1. Two years later, in 1988, Samsung then brings out their 4 megabit chip, pulling them to parity with the Japanese. Japan from there on began to crumble. The Kirin 9000S is like that, a visible mark on technology history, a shock in the ecosystem that ripples far beyond this small semiconductor neighborhood. The People's Republic of China is taking the Korean approach to semiconductor manufacturing. It worked for South Korea. It is working for China too. So now what? Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.